Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ, and today we're gonna do some distro hopping. I'm gonna load six different Linux distros or operating systems onto my framework and test them out a little and maybe figure out which one's best. Let's do this. First things first, let me set up the intended audience for this. While this video should be informative for everyone watching with all levels of Linux experience, it's not really intended for the Linux experts out there. I'll be describing things as not working that can be fixed by most people with a working knowledge of Linux. However, this video is intended for the Linux noob, someone with little to no knowledge or experience running Linux, but has moved or is planning to move to a framework laptop and is considering joining the Linux community. So the objective of the video is to install six different Linux operating systems on my framework and assess several things. First, the installation process from the ease of navigating the distro's download page and how obvious it is to select the correct version is the creation of the installation media hassle-free and straightforward we'll look at a few points of the installation process such as levels of automation is there an offline installer in the event of no network connection is the disk setup or partitioning process manual or automatic and once installed, is there an automated or manual setup process? Then we'll see if all the laptop's features work out of the box, meaning without having to do anything, does the display scale properly? Does the trackpad function? Does the Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, camera, microphone, and fingerprint reader actually work? And if not, is it an easy fix? Maybe just a click in the system settings or a simple package install, either with a short terminal command or through the GUI software manager? Or is it more complex? Like, does it require some code editing and compiling? Next, I'll run just a few simple benchmarks on the system to determine if there's any slight performance differences between the operating systems. Finally, I'll test the power management and battery life for each of the distros. One last thing before I get into the main event, I wanna clear up a few misconceptions about the framework laptop and Linux. There's a common misperception that's even been perpetuated online by people in my line of work that the framework laptop is open source and built for Linux, and that's not really true. It is, of course, easy to open and I can source all the parts needed to repair and hopefully upgrade the device, but all the hardware and the firmware in here is proprietary. As a consumer, I don't have access to the system's firmware base code that I can tweak to my needs. I can't download the mainboard schematic so I can modify it and have my own made if I wanted. And this is completely understandable for reasons I'm not gonna get into today. Also, while the framework does have a large fan base within the Linux community and support directly from the framework team and many of the Linux distro developers, it's not necessarily made for Linux. This is very much a Windows laptop. It's optimized to run Windows. In fact, when I got this, I installed Windows 11 beta with no problems. All the requirements, TPM, secure boot, were already enabled. And with the driver package framework provides, everything I'm about to consider worked out of the box without issues. Also, with a couple exceptions, Windows 11 performs and definitely has better power management than the Linux distros I tested. So why even consider Linux? Well, that's a huge talking point, and I'll touch on it in a bit, but now let's get into these distros and I choose these six based on responses I got from you guys from one of my community posts. They are Pop OS, Manjaro, Fedora, Zorin OS, Endeavor OS, and Elementary OS. These will all be clean bare metal installs, meaning they're installed directly on the framework boot drive, not a virtual machine, and as a sole boot operating system. We'll start with Pop! OS, and when you click the download link on the website, it'll bring up a couple of options. The version followed by LTS means long-term support. This is System76 polished and most stable version, but it's not necessarily the most up-to-date. 
The version on the left is updated every six months and will typically have the most updates for newer hardware like the framework. Once you select that, we can download the non-NVIDIA version as we don't need the NVIDIA drivers for the framework. Once the ISO was downloaded, I used Etcher to create the bootable installation USB for each of the distros as it's probably the most simple method for beginners and it worked without issue for all six of the distros I tested. The only change I had to make to the framework to install these operating systems was to disable the secure boot option in the system BIOS. This isn't necessary for every distro, but I just left it disabled for all the testing. Booting from the USB just involved plugging in the thumb drive, spamming the F12 key until the boot selector appeared, and then simply selecting the USB. Again, all six distros launched without issue from the USB on the first attempt. The Pop! OS installation process was very simple. It offered an offline installation wizard with basic or more advanced options. It also gave the option to install the OS on the framework storage expansion cards. And let me pause right here and say that I have tested this, it works, and I have actually been running a dual boot on my framework with Windows 11 on the SSD and Linux on the expansion. However, if you want to say have multiple storage expansions with different distros on each one to swap in and out, this will be problematic as new installations will overwrite the boot manager with the new distro. There are ways to overcome this, but editing your boot manager is more for advanced users. Moving on, the rest of the installation is pretty straightforward. You do have the option to encrypt. I recommend doing this unless you're distro hopping like me, as in many cases, it will require you to decrypt the disk to install a new distro. Once the installation was complete, I restarted the laptop and was greeted by the setup process. You can also see that high DPI mode was enabled by default and the display had the proper resolution and scale, so we can check that box. You also notice that the trackpad multi gestures were enabled and Wi-Fi was working and able to connect to my home network, so there are two more boxes checked. After installing each distro, the first thing I did was update them so I was working with the latest packages, and in most of the distros, this can be easily done in the GUI package manager or app store, but I always prefer doing this in the terminal. Once the system was updated, I tested some of the onboard hardware such as the camera and microphone, both of which worked perfectly out of the box. Now in the system settings under using settings, there is no option for enabling the fingerprint reader and in fact the reader does not function out of the box on Pop! OS and there isn't what I would consider a beginner method of enabling it. However, thanks to the Linux community, there is a solution provided by community member Brett Kaczynski on his blog that I followed to the letter and it worked. And then, barring the idea from a framework community member, I wrote a script that should quickly reproduce the process on any Debian based distro. I have provided a link to the script in the description below, however, just like Henry mentions in his post, you should definitely be very cautious when downloading and running scripts from random strangers on the internet. So, you know, do at your own risk. However, I can say that my script did in fact work and once I ran it and it was system restart, I now had fingerprint options in the user settings. I was able to enroll my fingerprint and then use biometrics to log into the system, wake from sleep, and even authorize root access in the terminal, which is great for me since I tend to use a 16 or more digit admin password. One note on fingerprints, if you are distro hopping, be sure to delete your fingerprint before installing a new distro, as you won't be able to enable another fingerprint if you don't without some more of that intermediate level troubleshooting. After I checked or got all the hardware devices running on the distros, the next thing I did was run a couple of benchmarks to see if there were any differences in performance. I ran Geekbench 5, you see here, which is actually running on Manjaro. I didn't capture footage of this every single time, but there will be a chart covering the results at the end, and I ran Heaven for iGPU performance. 
Finally, to test power management and battery life for each OS, I set the power level to balanced if it was available, and then I opened a few applications and Firefox running three tabs, the top tab playing a YouTube playlist at 4K, and I let it run for an hour, recording the battery drop from 100%. I then put the laptop in suspend mode for an hour, recording the additional power loss. Again, these numbers will be in the chart at the end. Okay, I went through each of the metrics on POP, but for time's sake, the rest of the distros, I'll just highlight the key areas. For example, the speakers, microphone, and camera worked out of the box for every distro, so there is a need to show that for every single one. Again, everything will be summarized at the end. Let's move on to Manjaro, and Manjaro is an Arch-based distro and comes by default in a few different DEs or desktop environments. I'm not getting into DEs in this video, I just tested each distro using its default DE or most typically used. In the case of Manjaro, I went with the XFCE desktop. After booting from the USB installation media, Manjaro offered a fairly straightforward install and setup process, albeit initially the scale was too small. However, the Wi-Fi was enabled out of the box. There were options to automatically set up partitions or to take a more manual approach. After installing and rebooting, I was able to connect to Wi-Fi and easily change the scaling factor. Getting the fingerprint reader to work just involved installing the proper packages, which I did through the GUI package installer. Once installed, there's no default user interface for enrolling fingerprints, however this can be fairly easily done in the terminal with a single command. Once you have your fingerprints enrolled, initializing the use of biometric login and pseudo use is done by editing a few configuration files with a short line or two of text. I'd say this isn't necessarily a beginner level task, but anyone who's able to carefully follow directions should be able to do it with minimal effort. The only part that hung me up was the fact that at login, the system reads your fingerprint with no other confirmation other than the password box disappears, which I didn't notice at first. Then you still need to click the login button. Other than that, everything else worked out of the box for Manjaro. Moving on to Fedora, and we want the workstation version, and although I typically wouldn't recommend a beta version of an operating system, some very quick research informed me that Fedora 35 is the way to go for the framework. Again, loading the installation media was hassle-free, and the installation process was not difficult. Fedora also presented the option to install the OS to the expansion storage. It also detected the previous Linux install on the SSD and required manual deletion of the partitions. After installation and reboot, there was a very straightforward setup process and again, Wi-Fi was good to go. There was even the option to enable third-party repositories. After the setup process, there was even a quick tour of the GNOME 41 DE, which I skipped but shouldn't have because I don't have much else to show you in Fedora. Everything 100% worked out of the box, including the fingerprint reader with the GNOME UI ready to go. In fact, the only tweak I had to make to the distro, and this is purely personal preference, was installing GNOME tweaks so I could change the right click function from the Linux default double finger click to the more Windows centric right area click. However, I can also say that Fedora and GNOME 41 have the best multi-gesture incorporation of any of the distros I tested. So to the Fedora fans out there, I apologize for not lingering on this operating system, but that means there were no issues to highlight. Moving on to the Zorin OS, and here there is a paid version which delivers desktop environments that look and function very much like modern versions of Windows and Mac OS. This is a good option if you plan on moving to Zorin long term and the cost goes directly to the small development team so they can keep the lights on. For testing, I'll be using the Zorin OS 16 core version. Again, installation and setup was straightforward and resembled other Debian based distros. There were automatic and manual partitioning options as well as the ability to install to the expansion storage and third party repositories could be selected for install. After installation, I did notice this was the first distro that didn't immediately prompt me to connect to an available network, 
and after some quick checks i confirmed the intel wi-fi card was not recognized or initialized by the of however the bluetooth was so i used a wired connection through a usb-c hub and started by installing the appropriate drivers for the card but after a system reboot there was still no connection so i went with the next option and upgraded the linux kernel to the recommended version 5.12 which was also unsuccessful. So Wi-Fi doesn't get a check in this distro. I was, however, able to get the fingerprint reader installed using the same script I wrote for Pop! OS. I could then enroll my prints through the UI and it worked. Now, because it was highly requested, I also tested elementary OS. However, I expected it to function essentially the same as Zorn and it did, but I'll quickly take you through it. On the download page, you'll notice that you're prompted to buy elementary OS by paying what you can. And if you can, I highly encourage you to because these are very small and dedicated and in most cases volunteer developers that work on these distros. So donations help them continue to do that. But, and I'm almost reluctant to show you this, if you're just trying out the distro, you can download it for free. Installation was about as simple as it gets with advanced options for those who need them and also the expansion storage install options. Again, here Wi-Fi was not installed and again, I tried both installing the Intel drivers and upgrading the kernel. However, this again did not correct the problem. Using my script, I was able to install the fingerprint reader. However, elementary doesn't have a user interface for enrolling fingerprints. So just like I did in Manjaro, I enrolled my fingerprints through the terminal. Finally, the last distro I looked at is Endeavor OS, which like Manjaro is another Arch based OS and the download page does provide a lot of information about what does and doesn't come in the installation package and distro and different options for installing the OS. Beginner users may not completely understand all of this, but at the bottom of the page, the ISO can be downloaded either from your region or the worldwide GitHub server. Once you boot into the installation USB, you're greeted with a welcome menu and by clicking start the installation, you have the options to do an online install which will enable you to select all the available desktop environments or the offline installer which will install the default XFCE desktop. Again, the installation process is simple, basically identical to Manjaro with all the options for both novice and advanced users. After installing, I encountered the first problem of not being able to read anything because the scale was way too small and I tried correcting this in the display settings, however changing the scale to 1.5x and 2x actually made things worse by doing exactly the opposite of what I expected. I actually tried some down and dirty display spoofing unsuccessfully and I had almost chalked it up as a distro fail until I remembered the advice I give to all new Linux users. Read the freaking manual. So a quick search in the Endeavor wiki and in 30 seconds I found my mistake and I was able to set the scale in the correct location. And with a quick reboot I could see what was on the screen. Again, everything worked out of the box except the fingerprint reader and because Endeavor is very terminal centric, there's no GUI package installer like in Manjaro. However, I was able to easily install the required packages in the terminal and again using the enroll command to set up the fingerprint and then edit the same config files I did in Manjaro to get the biometrics working. Okay. Here's the charts I promised to summarize all the operating systems. Starting with the installation process, every distro was very easy to install. There was an easy to identify ISO to download. Creating a bootable USB with Etcher was successful. They all had offline installers to preempt any network problems on install. And they all offered customization and partitioning options for beginners and advanced users alike.
As far as out of the box hardware support, the green check mark means it worked out of the box. A yellow check mark means it was a relatively easy process to get working, just a setting to change or a simple package install. A red check mark means it took some advanced level intervention, and a red X means it just didn't work. As you can see, Fedora was the only distro that's green across the board, with the two arch distros not too far behind with simple setting clicks to change the scale and a relatively easy package install and process to get the fingerprint reader working. While Pop, Zorn, and Elementary got red checks for the reader as, unless you use the script I wrote, took a bit of work in the terminal and some code editing and recompiling. Finally, Zorn and Elementary earned the red X's as by following troubleshooting guides for other Debian based distros, I couldn't get the Wi-Fi to work. However, this isn't definitive. There's very likely a solution, simple or otherwise, that I just didn't have time to pursue. Moving on to the performance metrics and looking at the single core scores, we see that single core performance is all pretty close to even across the board and is in line with what we typically see in Windows. However, the Debian based distros and to a slightly lesser degree Fedora fall behind the Arch distros in multi-core performance, likely due to Endeavor and Manjaro's lighter weight and more current kernels. Their scores are right in line with Windows 11 scores. In iGPU performance, we also see Manjaro pull ahead, unfortunately the low Endeavor scores due to an incompatibility, as even though the test was set to 1080p, Endeavor would only run it at the framework's native resolution. When we look at power usage, again we see the lighter weight Arch distros drain the battery a little less. Also, because I was using a USB hub that did draw power from the framework to tether network access for Elementary and Zorin, I wasn't able to replicate the power draw test for those distros, but we do see that all six distros lost 5% battery charge while in suspend or sleep mode. This is definitely quite a bit more than the 16% active and 1.5% sleep power draw I see in Windows running the same tests. So there you have it. Not all Linux distros are created equal. And you may be asking if it doesn't just work, if I'm not gonna have a smooth frustration free experience, why even consider Linux? Well, I admit Linux isn't for everyone. Many Linux distros are developed and maintained by very small teams or even groups of volunteers that have a passion for free open source software. They're typically not published by big multi-million dollar corporations that are more interested in collecting and selling your browser history and metadata. So if you value security and privacy and like the idea of knowing exactly what your operating system is doing behind the scenes on your computer and you want the ability to fully control, tweak, or modify the OS to fit your needs and your hardware, you might want to give Linux a try. Now, obviously, I just demonstrated that not everything always works like it should out of the box with Linux. And to be fair, this has a lot to do with the uniqueness of the framework laptop. The framework uses a non-traditional display resolution, has a brand new Wi-Fi 6 card, and biometrics. So, for example, when Intel released the new Wi-Fi 6 card in here, the coordination with Microsoft and the Windows drivers were ready and available at the same time. However, it takes Linux developers a little longer to incorporate an open source version into their distro packages. But the point is they do. In fact, there are many examples of Linux distro development members in the framework community forums explaining current limitations of their distros on the framework and offering solutions. Most importantly, they're working to make all the changes necessary so the next update 100% works. For example, Fedora 34, not everything worked, but Fedora 35 that I installed, good to go. So if you don't have the time or knowledge to say, get the fingerprint reader working and initiated through the terminal in elementary OS, just give it a little time and the dev team will have it incorporated into their user interface. Okay, ultimate question. You just got your batch one, two or three framework or you're waiting on your batch four or five and you wanna try out Linux. Which distro should you choose? Well, first, if you're truly a Linux noob, 
I would avoid the Arch-based distros for now. So Manjaro and Endeavor that I tested, because of the target audience of this video, I didn't even test vanilla Arch Linux. Now, this is a big debate within the Linux community and people will argue with me, but my experience with Linux goes back over 20 years and I've never recommended an Arch-based distro to a beginner. Now, once you gain some experience with Linux, like you get your yellow or orange belt in Linux Foo, then you might find something like Endeavor a little more intriguing. Now, Fedora was the only distro that checked all the boxes, and while I always thought of Fedora as a workstation OS for developers, over the past couple of years, it really has become a good desktop operating system, even for beginners. And with a few tweaks, it can be very worry-free and is a good choice for the framework. However, my recommended distro for a true beginner is now and has always been a Debian based distro like Pop OS that you saw today. Now, while these distros aren't the fastest to get all the latest updates and upgrades, we saw that with Zorn and Elementary, they are generally the most stable and hardest for a new user to break. They're also the least intimidating for new users. With a distro like Pop OS, you can do pretty much anything you want to do without ever having to type a single line into the terminal. Not that I encourage that, but I'm a realist. I know that that command line can be intimidating. Now, Pop OS is a great choice, and it's based on my distro of choice, Ubuntu, which, despite it being the most widely used distro, I excluded it from this video, and that's because at the time this video is published in a few days, Ubuntu 20.10 will be released. So. I'm going to be installing it on my framework and daily driving it for a while. And then the plan is to share the experience with y'all and to take you through the whole thing step by step, installing it as a dual boot with Windows, tweaking it, fixing any hardware or driver problems, not that I expect any, and how to set up the OS along with some other utilities so you can have a hassle-free user experience and a great springboard starting point into the Linux community. I'm not gonna rush it. I don't wanna miss anything that could be problematic for new users, so make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss that. In the meantime, if you have any questions, be sure to ask in the comments below. And don't forget to hit that like. It actually helps get this content out to more people with similar interests. I hope you learned something. That is why I do what I do. Hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe.